Well, hello again, everybody. This is John Norris at Trading Perspectives. As always, we have our good friends, Sam Clement and Courtney Trosh. Y'all say hello. How's it going? Hey, John. Hey, guys. Uh, you know, recently the government announced a test course, reading and mathematics for fourth graders and eighth graders across the country. Just how are we doing in 2022 relative to 2021? And it goes all the way back. These are yearly tests. And guys, if I'm not mistaken, most recent test scores weren't all that good. They're awful. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for it. And you have the teachers unions and every and the establishment saying this, that, and the other thing. But where the rubber meets the road, if I'm not mistaken, Sam, according, it was one of the biggest yearly drops that we've seen. It in, was in the scenes. biggest. Yeah, the biggest, especially for mathematics. I mean, Sam, I mean, you know, I understand that you're not an education expert or anything like that. But why did this happen? Well, we talked about this, you know, right when COVID, I guess, was first really taking a hold and then soon after we started to recover a little bit we talked about what the new normal was going to look yeah. like what some longer term impacts were going to be and this was probably the one i think we were most confident in but we also said it was one that's going to take several years to at least start figuring it out and it's going to take probably decades to realize the full impact of it and i think this is just kind of the first first glimpse of that and i think when you look at it, it there's two things that are shocking one how much we dropped first the 2019 levels mm-hmm. which yeah. were i guess the last normal level yeah. and two how bad they were in the first place <laughs> they, they weren't good yeah. before then mm-hmm. yeah and then on top of that we add the biggest drop in the history of these tests but it's not i would say that this is not unique to the united states i it's, mean it's somewhat it's unique. global well i mean the fact that you don't think the pandemic has affected all children uh, I, I everywhere meant, i meant how poor our levels are i guess yeah. even in 2019 yeah, I mean, Courtney, I, I, from what I understand in terms of PISA scores and what have you, they're all a little bit lower after the pandemic. It's just hard to teach children as effectively when you're trying to do it on a computer or a telephone or, right. or something like that. Remote learning might be okay for someone who's in graduate school who has the discipline to really pay attention. or And when you're not trying to do a whole day's worth, I mean, that's that's the whole deal. Even remote learning, like with, with my students in college, my students, my children in college, you know, they're taking one class at a time. They're not trying right. to do a full day lesson just turn it on at eight cut it off at three there's absolutely no way that you're going to maintain people's interest and and let's face it I mean let's let's be honest you know the people that are get who got hurt the most but from what I can tell in the in the data that I read were people in the lower income spectrums right and the reason for it is numerous but primarily they have less access to to good high-speed internet broadband what have you even devices in the home and so when you're trying to do remote learning and in the poorer sections all of a sudden you don't have a good good dial-up or not even a dial-up you don't have a good internet connection those people are going to fall even further behind I mean 30 almost 30 percent of eighth graders in this test were essentially functionally illiterate by the by, the standards that they well, that, that's that's not the term that they use. It's pretty close it, it, to yeah. It's a basic and not. It was the lowest level, and then close to thirty percent were under that lowest level. You right. know, I mean, the the numbers truly are shocking. Now, not surprisingly, some areas do better than others. But uh, for instance, I just pulled this up. You know. Percentages at or above the NAEP proficient and NAEP mathematics for fourth grade public school students in Baltimore City. Baltimore City, where I used to work, started off my career in Baltimore City, families historically from that section of the country, only 7. Only 7%. Can read proficiently? Oh, that's mathematics, at or above proficiency levels. Nation as a whole is only 35 I mean, 65% of the kids across the country are below median, well, or below where they should be. Where they should be. But seven, only seven in Baltimore County, Baltimore City. In Cleveland, that number is only 4% are proficient or higher. And in Detroit, drum roll please, the number is three. Well, it makes you think, one, I mean, I can speak as a parent that, have, that has younger children during the pandemic. It really wasn't that they were. It wasn't the equivalent of the school day, them sitting at a computer. Yeah. They had assignments that they had to be that they had to do. So it was very stressful for myself as a parent to then turn into not only trying to work but also trying be to a be teacher. the teacher. Yeah, being the primary educator and um, 
it was not good for my relationship with my child. Um, and I do think that you have to think through, yes, these children might not have access to internet, but even at that, if they're already at, kind of to Sam's point, if there, it already wasn't great beforehand, these students more than likely don't have the skills to teach themselves. And basically that's what they were asked to do. They were asked to teach themselves. And then what we've given maybe a year and a half of what we consider regular school year for them to like make up what they've already lost. Like they're already working. And then the educators don't want to all these kids to repeat, right? They don't want to have to deal with them again. And that's going to create, you know, where they're going to have to have more teachers for the grades because they have to have the kids repeating grades because they haven't accomplished. So they keep pushing them along. And this is really nothing new to your point. They're in lower income areas or in, um, certain demographics like you are going to have just they keep just shoving kids along these lemon teachers or whatever they say i mean again this is something Tenured. yeah i mean we're Which they're lemons lemons like a car yeah okay but you know this isn't unique to even just i mean we saw everyone that has seen schools and when people went back to school and and what they were doing whether everyone was eating by themselves with you know 10 feet apart from each other i mean well, that's, even, so, that's even psychologically the, damaging yeah too. even the yeah. even the back Trust to me. school experience wasn't wasn't normal john knows from personal yeah. experience <laughs> people were intimidated yeah, by yeah, yeah that's what it was that's, that's, that's right. but then on top of that we still have over 2 million women that have left the workforce, and there's plenty of men, too, that is has to be related to this. You talked oh, about sure. how the struggle for of sure. working and doing that. A lot of people just opted out of one of them. Like, well, when you have the ability to step back, like if you're financially stable enough, I think COVID did make people look at it and, like, reprioritize, um, you know, what's important in, in their lives. And obviously a lot of people, if they have the means – and they see that their kids are regressing or something like that, and they feel like, okay, that's where my attention needs to be, then they might decide to exit the workforce or cut back hours so that they can dedicate time to supporting their child. I mean, whatever that looks like. Um, there are so many different options of, you know, tutoring and stuff like that. But, I mean, this is very personal for me because, you know, having two kids in elementary school, we definitely saw regression. And it was frustrating, too, because you don't really know what to do. And then you ask, okay, are there tutors? Are there opportunities to help? And it's like, oh, well, everyone's kind of at the same level. Like, we're assessing it across the board. And to me, what I'm hesitant about, They're John, essentially giving you soft answers. Right. No, no and I'm answers. like, no, I need something tangible yeah. to do to make it better. And, you know, to your point, John, if, if, it's, if it's that bad, I guess, and I don't mean to question the institution itself, and I, I mean that well, as like all of education, but you wonder, are they now going to look back and say, okay, well, only 4% are at proficiency, so let's bring down proficiency so that we can have more kids. Like, maybe we need to reassess our standards. But, but this is looked at globally. Yeah, this, this is, is yeah. compared to countries well, like yeah. fin Finland and Korea, uh, Japan, Singapore, all these areas that are well over 50% are in the proficient, the highly proficient level, where the U.S. has had, I think, maybe one state at most. I think Massachusetts, Massachusetts has been the highest yeah. um, previously. I mean, there is states that test compared to countries in the lowest quintile california being one of them california is what the fifth largest global economy something like that i mean it, it, it's it's massive and they're in the lowest quintile for for how we're educating our, our kids and we've talked about that being one of the core tenets to growing an economy and, oh, yeah. and a strong economy is the development of human capital and we are failing at that and we look at our labor force right i mean john you can kind of speak to that and you say okay well we've yeah we might need restaurant um servers and we might need you know different levels of positions but we also need to be able to push technology and we have to have people in the medical field and you know in different highly educated positions and are we going to be able to have that john well, you know, Courtney, that's a great question, and it's uh, the quick answer to that is I don't know. I mean, it's uh, and I think that, that will uh, vary significantly from location to location. In places like Massachusetts, where they do a good job developing their human capital and the test scores are all above average and what have you, probably that's probably no no no, no sweat, absolutely no sweat. But you get to sections of even of our state, which is clearly one of the poorer states in our in our country, you have sections in our state where there's 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 I think very little hope. I mean, and, and there's just and the education, but you know, 
the education is poor even by Alabama standards. So these children are coming out, you know, like they are in Cleveland, four per, only 4% are doing the work at the grade level, you know, that type of deal. What options are there for these people out there? And there really aren't any. I mean, right. because in the 21st century, it's a knowledge-based economy. You could say arguably that in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and even section up to about halfway through the 20th century, there's more of a physical labor was a much more valued proposition uh, in, in the in the in, in the production process. Now that's completely different. So these people are getting completely left behind. And oh, by the way, Sammy didn't mention it. The United States spends a lot of money on education. It's not a question of right. resources because enough. the amount of money that we spend is significantly higher than a lot of these countries on the PISA test scores that eat our lunch. I mean, and so we spend that much more and we're getting that much less. And I'm not exactly sure where the hue and cry is in terms of the parents, people like you, Courtney, have four kids. So they're saying enough is enough. You know, I mean, it's... What, what, what's so, going on here? I can't understand that people in Cleveland not up in arms. It's only 4%. A, a lot Baltimore of, City, only 7 And in Detroit, only 3 right. A lot of our education, the levels of education in parts of our country, are really more in line with those of emerging market economies. Yes. And then on top of that, you add in the fact that the cost of labor makes it not competitive for mm-hmm. these areas. So it's a scary thought to say... Really, we're competing. Some of these areas in terms of education are more in line and competing with those of Indonesia, Brazil, things like that, where the cost of labor is so much cheaper. And, and it makes it a very hard hard battle to argue that, that there's a, a lot of optimism when you're not developing human capital, yet it costs a whole lot to, to use that human capital. No, I mean, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, even sections of some of our poor Black Belt counties where the soil is rich but people quit farming, um, you know, except for pine trees, I guess you could say, uh, even the federal minimum wage at 725 is too high. I mean, without a doubt, because the labor force participation rate in some of these counties are in the 20 and 30 percent, meaning that there's just nothing to do at whatever jobs they have. People, I mean, employers or potential employers think the people there aren't even worth seven to seven and a quarter. Right. And so, I mean, you know, what you're saying about all these big cities is we're just consigning a lot of these children to failure. Right. And that's what sucks. It absolutely sucks. We can we can we can dance around it, all that stuff, but the people who are in charge of education in these areas should be ashamed of themselves. We should be ashamed of of ourselves and our state for not demanding more. However, we all live in communities where we do demand more. And so it's really, we can blame Randy Weingarten or what have you, all these people, and then she's the teacher's union head and all that stuff. But ultimately, a lot of this stuff starts at, starts at home. And if, if you don't demand it, you won't get it. Well, to that point, I mean, what are tangible changes that can be made? I mean, you already alluded to the fact or said that mm, there's enough money. We are putting enough money into the system. So is it providing alternatives, right? Because if there's a monopoly and there's only one school in your area, well, then that's the only one school you can go to. But if you had magnet schools or charter schools, do you think that that could potentially where you could pay teachers more, recruit better teachers? I mean, do you think that that would make a difference? I'm all for student choice. Hundred yeah. percent. It's uh, it's in some of these areas, it's worth a shot, uh, because clearly the results aren't there. However, there's a very difficult to get things changed in those areas because it's an indictment of the of the officials that'll have to essentially say, okay, let's do the charter schools because they have the power to say yes or no, and by doing so, they're admitting their failure. So that's that's right. why it gets kind of difficult. Uh, I would say, I mean, you have to get parents more engaged. I mean, it's a, no way you have, like in Cleveland, 4% are proficient or not, and have all the parents completely engaged in, in the educational process. You know, it's not that, my, not that my parents were teaching me calculus or anything like that, but they at least made sure that I did my homework and made sure that if I did have a question, they could at least help with an answer and what have you. And I'm sure that you're that way as well, Courtney. Yeah. And I'm sure, Sam, your parents were that way with you. Yeah. Uh, so that's those are some of those things. But uh, regardless of, of those things, test scores, I mean, of the reasons for it, it does paint a very ugly picture with a dirty brush, in my estimation, of just how well prepared our students are going to be 
in the 21st century knowledge-based economy and Sam kind of going to what your comments are about emerging economies and, and places like Indonesia and what have you which are rapidly advancing some of these test scores they're going to be taking jobs away from um, from kids here in the United States and I've, I've always said that you know what's different about the 21st century compared to the 20th and the 19th is your children aren't according aren't going to be competing for jobs just with people from Shelby County you know or Blount County or or Montgomery County, they're going to, they're going to be competing for jobs with people from uh, Georgia, Tennessee, and more than more importantly, around not, the world. Uh, just yeah. around the world. So at one point, when the when you graduated high school, could do the crossword, could read the do the jumble, and then go work in the mill, that economy is gone. And yeah. so we need to be very serious about what what the future holds. And I, I would I would vote for a whole bunch of Vogue Tech, whole bunch of Vogue Tech. If the kids don't want to do mathematics and reading and people can't understand it, by God, let's we'll teach them how to, to uh, be a welder. We'll teach them how to uh, be a brick mason, how, how to be an electrician, how, how to do that type of work, sort of like what the Germans do. Well, and I know we've talked about this, and, and teachers might say, oh, well, already having classes be from 745 to 245, you know, there's PE, there's movement from, you know, room to room, there's, you know, lunch or whatever, they have specials, all this stuff. So it's not like they're getting structured learning throughout like every second of the day, right? But to me, as a parent with young children, um, it's exhausting. Like I work a full day and then go home and have to cook dinner and then have to, you know, make sure everything's set for the next day, try to get them like, okay, what, what haven't you done on your homework? And then to try to teach them and knowing that they're frustrated and you're frustrated and tired. I can't imagine being a single mother or working multiple jobs and being responsible for that. I mean, it doesn't mean that you love your child any less, but at what point you say for them to advocate, I, I mean, you want to, but where is there a time in the day? I mean, these parents are already exhausted. And so I kind of say, is that not the opportunity for the government or for, like you were saying, if there are enough parents or, um, you know, representatives in Congress recognizing this, as you've clearly shown in the statistics, where they say, okay, we're going to do remediation. And if your child is below this level, then they're going to stay an hour after school or something like that. And yes, I, I know there's a whole host of other things that are tied to tr like transportation, all that, but that's also hard for parents, you know, making sure that their kids, um, you know, while they're working, are covered with someone watching them or something like that. So if they could make up and they could step in and tutor, you know, I just wonder if tangible steps to bring up the scores. I think that's really key. I just, I just wonder what this is, I mean, how this, you know, there's ways that it can get better, but how it's actually going to get better. I think yeah. there's a lot of people who say, and, you know, I pretty much agree. I think America is the best country in the world, but you know, there's not many things we lead the we lead the world in outside of incarcerated people and defense spending. I mean, there. <laughs> Again, you know, just such a such an uplifting. Um, I mean, we're, 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 we're middle of the road in education. Yeah. Literacy rates. We're not good at math. Yeah. I mean, oh, these things that like build good countries, we're not doing a great job of. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, it's kind of ripped that old Band-Aid off there. So, <laughs> it's, so it's, and Courtney, I know I sound horribly naive when I say parents have to demand it, but they do have to demand it. I'm, I'm yeah. not sitting here, I'm not going to try, try to say it's easy and all that type of stuff, but um, it's not a choice. Yeah, it's not an option. Yeah. You can't, you can't, I mean, you, you simply have to do what you got to do in order to uh, make sure that your children succeed. But that's a whole also point of like having elected officials. They represent the people. They should also be advocating for this because it's their future workforce. It's their, you know, and I think sometimes I just get very frustrated that, you know, do pol politicians not have passion for like what they're actually doing? Is it all a play about just having um, power? You know, is it I mean, just all about, are they I'd all narcissists? The yeah, I mean, so it's like, well, it should be about the children if it truly is. If you go into education, like, you should be passionate about that. Um, and so that's where I get frustrated, too, to your point, is, you know, there are tangible things that we should be doing, and we're putting enough money that we can pay to do those things. I completely agree with that. I agree. 
I'm not trading. I'm not trading prospectus with Courtney today on that. It's the first in a while. Yeah, that is really. We typically disagree with her pretty, pretty stringently. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so Sam, I mean, I'm not sure if we're covering all the bases when talking talking about uh, you know why this happened. Um, obviously, I think the pandemic had, had a huge chunk of it, but I also think according to, according to sort of what you've been hitting on, I think there might be something uh, kind of stagnant, or not ro- if not rotten or wrong with our educational system. And the longer that we take to analyze it and be true uh, and honest with, the, with ourselves about the need for reform and change, uh, you know, we're going to see, see these types of results and we're going to see more and more children being, being pushed behind. Yeah, and to Sam's point about incarceration, if we can increase education and increase literacy, typically that drives down uh, incarceration. Absolutely. So, yeah. there you go. There you go. Well, guys, we always love to hear from you all. So if you have any comments or questions, please, by all means, let us know. You can always drop us a line at tradingperspectives at oakworth.com, or you can leave us a review on the podcast outlet of your choice. As always, if you're interested in reading more or hearing more of what we have to say or how we think, please, by all means, go to oakworth.com. Take a look underneath the Thought Leadership tab for all kinds of exciting information. Guys, give you all one last chance to have deep thoughts on this topic. That's all I got. That's it, John. (laughs) That's all I've got today, too. Y'all take care.